Hello everyone, welcome back to another lecture. Today we are taking a look at Kurt Bayer, a 20th century Austrian, Australian, American uh, philosopher. Depends how you want to categorize people, I suppose. So he was uh, born in Austria, and then in 1938, much like Fackenheim, he went to Great Britain. Um, Bayer had partial Jewish ancestry, so of course, like Fackenheim, he was trying to escape the Nazis. Uh, and from Britain, he was uh, deported to an internment camp uh, in Australia. So Fackenheim wound up in Canada. Bayer ended up in Australia instead. Uh, and so they regarded as, as friendly enemy aliens. So they weren't exactly prisoners of war, but also weren't exactly free, at least initially. Um, but in being in Australia, Bayer stayed there and completed his, uh, um, or, or at least for a time, um, studied at the University of, of Melbourne. Then he went to Oxford. And he ended up eventually, he was back in Australia, ended up at the University of Pittsburgh for uh, quite some time, about, uh, what, three, three decades he was there, a little bit more than that. Uh, eventually retired to New Zealand with his wife, who, Annette Bayer, who's also a, a prominent and famous philosopher. Uh, so Bayer had quite a long career, and, and what we have here um, is remarks that he gave at Canberra University College in 1957. So this is really a, a kind of almost commencement address, or you can think of it something like that. Um, which itself is kind of funny when you think about the, the content of it, but this is what they would go on to talk about. Now, there's three parts to um, the reading here. I've only asked you to read the first part, not because I don't think the other two parts are, are worthwhile and interesting, but because we get some similar content from some other people and, and some other pieces in the course, and I don't want us retreading the same ground too many times. And so even though on this first part, uh, to some extent, Bayer doesn't explicitly address questions about, you know, the meaning of life and, and what it is he's talking about, how that connects to the meaning of life. He does go on in the subsequent sections to talk about it. So part of the reason I asked you to read the first part of Bayer here, and then we're following up with Russell, is because Bertrand Russell, who we're going to be looking at next day, uh, another very famous 20th century philosopher, he himself is um, very much an atheistic philosopher, uh, and he's really, in, in some sense, picking up on and almost to some extent presupposing some of the things that Bayer is saying in here, uh, and then trying to articulate some of the things that Bayer himself does, but does it in a somewhat different way. So by all means, if you want to read the rest of the Bayer piece, feel free. I would never discourage you from doing more reading and, and exploring more things, um, but you only have to read part one for what we're doing here. Now, part of what we're really doing uh, with this, this turn to Bayer is um, taking a look towards a, a scientific, secular approach to questions of, of the meaning of life. So in the first chunk of the course, we've been looking at theistic responses. So we can think Craig, Tolstoy, Quinn, Fackenheim, um, Rosemont to some degree, uh, depending on how we want to count that. Uh, and of course, we've, we've seen some responses already. So we've seen um, Nozick you know, raising some questions, though not necessarily pressing the point and actually trying to give us an exact alternative, but rather raising some, some potential issues for um, a, a theistic response. Now, what we're getting here with Bayer is someone who is, um, rather than I'd, I'd say questioning the adequacy of the theistic response, someone who instead uh, is not only questioning, but ultimately concludes that a theistic approach to these sorts of answers really isn't going to do the trick. That in some sense, um, those theistic responses, while they might provide one uh, template for a meaningful life, and this is going to vary depending on who we're seeing throughout here, um, some of the things we're going to look at ultimately are, are just going to reject the theistic response and say, that's just not going to do the trick. It's somehow insufficient. Others are going to be a little bit more open-ended and say, well, a theistic response could be one kind of response that might lead to a meaningful life, but is it necessary for a meaningful life? So it could be one among many candidates. So uh, part of the reason I've got Bayer in here followed by Russell, 
both of them sharing this secular, scientific, atheistic perspective, uh, is really to, to mark this transition where we're starting to move away from the, the theistic responses, not forgetting them, but simply moving away from them and seeing what the alternatives might be. Now, something that's fairly interesting, so with Bayer here, really what we're gonna see uh, is he's dealing with the adequacy of scientific versus theological explanations. Uh, and so we'll come back to that. That's really gonna be our focus here in this lecture. Uh, and fair warning, and I'm sure you already know this because you've seen how long the lecture is, uh, even though I I'm not done recording it yet, I'm already anticipating it's gonna be a fairly long one just because of the amount of content in here. Um, so we're gonna be looking at, at Bayer really arguing here that secular scientific explanations are, are no worse off than theological, uh, religious explanations for say the origins of the universe um, and, and big sorts of questions like that, then in fact we can have just as good of answers from science as we could hope to get from religion. Um, so that's really what Bayer's gonna be arguing. And then Russell is gonna be picking up on that and, and ultimately arguing that taking something like the theistic response is mistaken and really we need to look for a meaning in life in a secular scientific perspective. Uh, but of course that opens the door to the fact that um, not all lives go well. Many lives are marked by, by suffering. Uh, all lives are ultimately marked by death. Some of the things that we've seen already come up in, in Craig and Tolstoy. And so once we, we make this pivot with Bayer and um, Russell, after that we're going to turn to the last theistic response we have out of the text, which is really about Buddhism. Uh, and then we're also gonna look at Arthur Schopenhauer, a 19th century German philosopher, whose views share quite a bit with Buddhism. And part of what we're gonna see in both um, Schopenhauer and the reading on uh, Buddhism, which is by Gowans, uh, Christopher Gowans, is that they both really focus on suffering. So this week, perhaps this is not gonna be that, that cheery of a week, uh, I suppose it depends on your disposition, but we're gonna really be turning in some sense away from God, not to load that too much, uh, but looking at alternatives and, and what if we try to live in a universe without God? What if we don't believe in God or we, uh, you know, we're, we're not quite sure what to believe or we straightforwardly don't think there is such a personal caring being? What are we left with? Well, as we're gonna see Russell as well as, as Gowans and Schopenhauer in some sense all agree, we're left with lives that are characterized by a not a minuscule amount of suffering. Um, what do we make about that? Does that pose a kind of stumbling block for meaningful lives? We're gonna see Schopenhauer in some sense say yes. Uh, Russell doesn't think so. The Buddha, according to Gowans, also doesn't think so, but we'll, we'll get around to that. And then next week, we're gonna be getting into some other pieces, looking at some other responses to theism as well as pessimism, uh, and then getting into some other questions that arise from that secular scientific perspective. Okay, I think I want to stop there in terms of just where are we headed and, and where have we come from and get right into Bayer and, and get down to details. So this piece of his, The Meaning of Life, just the, the first part again. Uh, so I've subdivided this piece into sort of four main movements or, or parts sort of within that first part. So what's Bayer gonna do? Well, he's gonna distinguish between causal and teleological explanations. We get that fairly early on. This is something that I, I may have already talked about, but it's worth talking about within Bayer's context, certainly. Second, he considers the view that science cannot pro provide a full explanation, whatever that would be, for the existence of the universe because it only deals with causal explanations. So that's really gonna be his next step, looking at this challenge that, that scientific explanations are not really full explanations. That is, they always leave something out. This is really the, the issue he's looking at. He distinguishes, so draws another distinction between model and unvexing explanations. So we get two distinctions about kinds of explanations in this. So it, it, you gotta be careful to try to keep the details separate. And then finally, at the end of the piece, he argues, um, and this is really the point he's trying to make in the whole first section, he argues that scientific explanations explain their explicanda, the term that we'll get around to, better than non-scientific explanations, and that an ideal model explanation would leave nothing about the universe unexplained. That is, if 
if we were in a position where we just had enough knowledge gathered in the usual um, human way, right, the, the way we do this scientifically through observation, theorizing, checking, and so on, um, if we had enough time, if we had enough information, we would, could have a full scientific explanation of the universe and how it works and so on. And there'd really be nothing left out. There'd be no cosmic questions that go unanswered that need to be answered for us to really contemplate what would make for a meaningful life and be able to grapple with that question. So like I said previously, as you see here, Bayer's piece, uh, what we're reading in it itself, in some sense, doesn't fully address this question, you know, well, what's, what's the meaning of life? He talks more about that in parts two and three, but we're gonna look at some alternative readings for that. So really, why are we looking at Bayer? What's the point of this reading? What's the, what's the point of going through this? Well, uh, back when we were looking at some of the, the theistic responses, I'm, I'm thinking here, particularly Craig, but not just Craig, uh, other ones as well, part of what's going on in those responses is that we seem to be given a, a kind of template for a meaningful life or the picture of a meaningful life that we're given on the theistic view, um, at least from a certain sort of perspective. I'm, I'm thinking in here particularly the, the sort of Christian view, God the creator, you know, creates the whole universe, puts humans in here. We're gonna see uh, Bayer give a, a version of this in the next slide. Um, you know, we, we can turn to God and say, okay, well, why are we here and where are we going? What's our meaning or purpose? And then we can think in somewhat natural terms of, well, if God created the whole universe, created us as part of the universe, had some kind of role or, or plan um, in mind, like there's some kind of overall plan for the universe that we play a part in, we play a role, or perhaps there's a particular plan for each of us. Um, we can think in terms of, of our purpose or how we fit into that overall design. Um, we can also then think about issues like, well, you know, why, why does it matter if the universe exists or if it's been around so long or, or, you know, it's going to die off eventually or, you know, why does it really matter if I do this or that? So think about Craig. What really gives us ultimate significance and ultimate purpose? Well, God. God seems to be a fairly natural answer to that. But what if we take God out of the picture, right? What if we, you know, as I said, we're atheists, right? If you're not an atheist just for the sake of argument, take up the position. Just sort of say, okay, hypothetically, if I didn't believe in God, what kind of position would I be in that? What sorts of resources would I be losing for my ability to engage with uh, th this issue of the meaning of life, right? If I really were an atheist, or in the future, if I lose my, my faith, what am I gonna do then? What am I gonna believe? What is it reasonable to believe? And in fact, by trying to engage in some of these, you know, the exercises, these sort of thought experiments. Uh, you know, if I were in this different situation, what would I believe? It might, even if you are still ultimately committed to the initial view you had, it might help you see some more things and see some more angles on this topic than if you always stay within the position you're in. Likewise, if you are an atheist or an agnostic, take up the position of the theist, right? Try it on, so to speak, right? Well, what if I really believe that there is a being with these sorts of qualities and these sorts of characteristics and so on? Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead, jump right into Bayer. So like I said, Bayer really starts, before he even gets to part one, so we're just going to first page or two. Um, so what, this page 60, uh, 76 to uh, 78. Um, he really does just a little bit of history in here. So he talks about this really profound shift in worldview that's taken place over the last 500 years arguably even, even more recent, that really four or even perhaps 300 years. Um, so we can think about really since roughly the, the time of the scientific revolution, um, particularly uh, um, changes in, in cosmology, our views of the universe, our understanding about the earth and so on. So for medieval Christians, so prior to this, the shift that started around 500 years ago, but let's not get too exact. Um, Bayer just admits, he says, Tolstoy's crisis, right, that, that um, what we get in my confession, where Tolstoy thinks he's leading a good life, and it's meaningful, and it makes sense, and, and things are valuable, and so on, and then it just, he gets paralyzed by these questions, and just doesn't really know what to do. 
Um, Bayer says, you know, for a medieval Christian, Tolstoy's situation there just wouldn't make any sense. Why? Because for them, the Christian worldview would just seem obviously correct. Right? Uh, there'd be sort of no serious question, at least for most of them, um, about whether or not God actually existed and created the earth and the universe and so on. Now, why was this? Well, it really has to do with a, a number of different beliefs uh, that fit together into a fairly neat package if you're a medieval Christian. Uh, and these include, of course, you take the, the revelation from the Bible, right? you take all the things that the, the church is telling you. And of course, depending on exactly when we're talking, we're talking about a single Catholic universal Western church. Of course, there's the Eastern Orthodox as well. And that, that split was uh, occurred a long time ago, much, much earlier in the history of Christianity. Um, but within this sort of 500 year, um, you know, 500 ish years, give or take. Of course, there's also this question of the Protestant Reformation and, and a great uh, pluralism growing up around Christian beliefs. And even before the Reformation, it's not like um, all Christians had sort of one absolute uniform set of beliefs. There's great controversy within the Catholic Church. Um, you know, different monks and philosophers, different theologians interpreting things in different ways and arguing with each other about the appropriate way to understand God and God's plan and how we fit into it and what Christ was like and so on. So um, make no mistake, there's, there's always, as long as Christianity has existed, there's always been controversy around certain key beliefs and, and disagreement about them. Um, but 500-ish years ago, in that medieval uh, uh, mindset, really, a number of, of key beliefs seem to co at least cohere with each other and make some good sense, right? Uh, it seems like there's a, a fairly intuitive way to explain the world around us, the universe around us, uh, especially given the limitations on, on technology, uh, evidence gathering, and so on. But a scientific explanations grew powerful. Several parts of this traditional Christian explanation, so Christian sort of broad strokes or the Western Catholic, but really we could extend this to even the Eastern Orthodox. Um, parts of this just really started to break down. Of course, we can point out, uh, and, and Bayer does, to a couple of particular uh, factors. One, the replacement of the geocentric model of the solar system with the, the heliocentric. So the geocentric model of the solar system is that the Earth is at the center of our solar system and really the whole universe. So there was a whole cosmology, sort of a whole uh, theory of the heavens that came from roughly the, the ancient Greeks. Um, so Catholic theology took up quite a bit of Aristotle uh, in the Middle Ages and, and really incorporated that is part of really their explanation about how the world works. So medieval Catholicism, medieval Christianity, um, there's sort of a healthy dose of, dose of Aristotelianism in there for explaining how the natural world works, uh, as well as a sort of chunk of, of Plato. Uh, and this extended as well up to the heavens, uh, along with some revisions by some later fundamentally Greek thinkers. So this model is, has the earth at the center of the universe, around the earth, orbits the sun and the moon and the, the planets that were then known at the time, as well as the fixed stars that has all the other stars in the universe. Um, and really the universe itself, not horribly tremendous, you know, relatively large um, when we think about our, our local areas of interest, but really not that big, not anywhere near the kind of scope and scale we now think of. Um, the age of the earth as well. So the um, Bayer, dates that in here to being 4004 uh, BCE. Now, of course, we know now that the Earth is much, much older than that, millions, really billions of years. Uh, we know that not only does the Earth go around the sun, um, and you know the, the moon orbits the Earth, and the Earth orbits the sun, but our sun itself is, relatively speaking, a kind of orbit. It's part of a much larger galaxy, which itself is moving relative to other objects. Uh, and so really, what Bayer is trying to point to here is that for the medieval Christian, the various parts of the, sort of the Christian explanation of the world around us fit together in a very coherent manner. But over the last 500 years through scientific advances, 
uh, and, and really just more rigorous uh, evidence-based thinking about the world around us, some key parts of that uh, sort of medieval Christian explanation of the world around us really started to break down. Uh, we've radically altered our views on sort of the, the scope, scale, uh, and, and structure of the universe, um, how physical objects move through space, right? This is something, this was a big transition from that sort of medieval Aristotelianism to a more modern uh, force-based view, right? You, the, the sort of contemporary physics we now have, that's really an invention in the last 500 years. Um, advances in geology, understanding what the earth is made out of, um, how it likely came together, how old it is and so on. Um, Bayer doesn't touch on it. We could also get into questions about evolution, the fossil record and so on. Uh, these are all relatively modern inventions. A, a medieval Christian just would um, not have been familiar with any of it and probably would have um, not even understood some of, of what we might be telling them if we were trying to explain it to. Now, Bayer claims that where we are now, right, and this, this was back in the 50s when he was giving this book, I have no doubt he would be committed to it even more these days. Um, scientific explanations in his view are really just superior to religious explanations, uh, at least for natural phenomena, because they explain those phenomena more accurately and more reliably, as he put it, puts it in his words. And so this shift in um, explanatory power, uh, rigorousness, and so on, he says, might even make uh, religious explanations uh, inappropriate in some sense. Right? If we want to explain why a physical object moves the way it does, generally speaking, we're going to reach for theory and physics, not uh, a Bible or um, you know, a piece of theology. Now, there are still sort of questions that arise from this. So if scientific explanations are now better than religious explanations, so broadly speaking, uh, there is the, the potential here that what we get is a disenchanted universe. Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, a disenchanted universe is really one where value seems to be sucked right out of it. So scientific explanations, so one view on them goes, uh, they are perfectly able to explain value-free things like, say, the movement of a physical object through space. So if we're doing you know, physics or some chemistry or something like that, um, sure, scientific explanations can take care of that. But what they can't explain are things like values, things like purposes and significance. Here again, think of Craig. I think Craig does a very nice job in trying to highlight and show what some of the ramifications of this kind of thinking are. So it seems like maybe we lose something if we start signing purely with scientific explanations and jettisoning religious explanations entirely. One way to try to retain religious explanations as, as somehow uh, useful or really factoring into a full theory of everything is by maintaining that science and religion are really complementary. That really what we have going on here are two different kinds of explanations, each appropriate for some part of the world in some sense, uh, and that it's only when taken together do we really have full explanation of absolutely everything. Now, uh, Bayer puts it this way, he says, you know, some have tried to maintain that science and religion are not really in conflict. They are, on the contrary, mutually complementary, each doing an entirely different job. Science gives us provisional, if precise, explanations of small parts of the universe, while religion gives final and overall, if comparatively vague, explanations of the universe as a whole. So on this kind of view, one that sees scientific and religious explanations as playing two different but complementary roles, right? So religion and science is never really conflict. They're just doing two different sorts of things. Um, and, and this again was, uh, has been a fairly popular view through the history of, you know, the history of Western civilization, history of Christianity and so on. Um, that you can have reason through science, whatever exactly we characterize as science, can tell us a lot about the world, uh, but there is a special role for religion, there's a special role for, say, revelation or faith, or again, depends on the details um, of the particular view in question, but religion is giving us something more. Religious explanations add something that scientific explanations can't do by themselves, but the two never actually need to come in conflict. Now, 
on this kind of view, right, that sees the two kinds of explanations, religious and scientific, just doing different things, playing different roles, uh, seeing human existence as meaningless actually results from inappropriate use of scientific explanations. So rather than using scientific explanations for some kind of precise localized um, phenomena, right? We, we've got some particular issue and then we want to understand how it works. So science can help us do that, right? How, how do these objects move about or how does this chemical reaction occur? or How does this piece of biology work? Whatever it might be. On this view, rather scientific explanations are trying to be used for really existence as a whole, right? Why, why does anything exist at all? Or what's going on in the universe or something like that? Uh, but scientific explanations just can't do that. They really can't address questions of meaning and purpose. They can't give us a satisfactory account of where the universe came from, for instance. Uh, and that in particular is really ultimately the thing Bayer really wants to look at here. Uh, and the, the objection that it seems like human existence is ultimately meaningless because scientific explanations just cannot satisfactorily explain the origins of the universe. You know, where where we come from, how did everything start? Um, instead, it's always going to have to fall short somehow. Now, this view itself um, can be characterized by saying that scientific explanations are really only ever focused on how questions instead of why questions. And that why questions are really where meaningfulness comes in. So on this view in question here, right, the one that sees scientific and religious explanations as being playing separate roles and, and playing complementary roles, the view is that religious explanations deal with why questions, and those are really required, answers to why questions are required for meaningfulness. Hence, religious explanations are required for meaningfulness, whereas scientific explanations can only ever deal with how, right? Can only deal with um, a causal explanation, a, a mechanism of some sort. So a way of, of putting this is that if we want to know why somebody's done something, uh, and they just tell us how they did it, we aren't satisfied by the explanation, right? Because such an explanation doesn't tell us, as Bayer says, meaning, purpose, or point of things. So look, uh, a, a way of phrasing this objection, if you do something, right? Um, I don't know, you burn my house down, right? <laughs> and I, uh, forgive me, I always, I have sort of a very perverse sense of, um, Examples, right? And I always go to something that's usually fairly extreme and ridiculous and usually more of a repugnant in some sense. So say you burned my house down, right? Or or vice versa, maybe I should be the bad guy. I burn your house down, right? Um, so I burn your house down, and you know it was me, and you say, Carl, why'd you burn my house down? And I say, Well, I got uh, uh, you know, a thing of gasoline, I spread it everywhere and then lit a rag on fire and threw it in, and that's that's how it went up. You'd say, No, 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 I didn't ask. You know, how you burn the house down. I understand that you can spread gasoline and you know make a fire. Like I understand how that works. I don't know why you did it. But if I just keep telling you how I did it and never giving you a reason why I did it, you're not going to be satisfied. You're not thinking I'm actually explaining my actions. This is precisely the kind of objection that Bayer wants to examine and, and really respond to here. Um, that the objection is that. If we want to understand meaningfulness, we need explanations to why questions, not just how questions. And on this view he wants to reject, ultimately science is just in the business of giving explanations for how questions. It just doesn't explain why questions. So this is the view that he wants to consider and ultimately reject. So here's Socrates again. I talked about him. Uh, Early on, started a course, most time about what philosophy was. So it's always the godfather of Western philosophy, if you want to use that kind of terminology. He wasn't the first uh, Western philosopher, but he was uh, in many ways the most influential for setting the tone for things to come. Now, in Plato's Phaedo, so Plato, student of Socrates, another tremendously influential figure in Western philosophy, uh, Phaedo is the name of a, a dialogue of his, a book of his. It's the one that um, actually contains the death of, of Socrates in there. Socrates famously was condemned to death by the Athenians for, well, basically causing trouble. Uh, and so the Phaedo contains the story of, of Socrates um, 
you know, being in prison and ultimately drinking hemlock and dying. Well, in that piece, he distinguishes between two different sorts of explanation. One is a teleological explanation, and this is explaining things in terms of purposes, right? Um, why something happens. So explicanda is a word here. I'm gonna have a definition later in the slides as well. I didn't wanna put it on this particular slide, just didn't want it, uh, it already gets pretty full. Explicanda is the, the plural of explicandum, which is really just a thing to be explained. So an explanation of the things to be explained, right? Is really what's being said there. So we've got teleological explanations, purposeful explanations, why explanations, and then we've got causal explanations or how explanations. These ones specify necessary conditions for events to occur, right? Um, to get a particular kind of result, here are the kinds of causes you need. So just going back to um, this example, right? Say I burn your house down and, and you say, but Carl, why'd you burn my house down? You're looking for a teleological explanation. Why I did it? What was my purpose? Right? What was the reason? Of course, if I come back and I just keep giving you um, sort of necessary conditions that were met, I say, well, look, for a fire to occur, you have to have, I talk about the fire triangle, and then I say, you know, well, I had gasoline, I had ignition, and there was oxygen in the air. Right? If I explain it to you in those ways, in that, or in that way, right, in terms of, in some sense, causes, causal effects, uh, a sort of scientific explanation of how fires start, rather than an explanation of why I started this particular fire, you're not going to be satisfied, right? Um, now, so, so this is really just that distinction, right? This why versus how, that we can have different sorts of explanations that address different parts of um, what we want out of explanations. So in the Phaedo, Socrates maintained that teleological explanations were superior, that really um, explanations in terms of why were the most important kind of explanation, and in fact, um, that all things could have both kinds of explanation. Socrates held that we can explain all things, both in terms of how they occur, what sorts of conditions are required for them to occur, as well as why they occur, that is, what sorts of reasons can be given um, why things happen one way rather than another, beyond mere causes, right? Rather than just pointing to causes, that we can point to causes and how they make things occur, but also why things are, are organized or happen the way they are. So Socrates thinks really you need um, that both kinds of explanation to fully explain something, and that teleological explanations are actually the better kind of explanation. So if you can only have one explanation, you're better off with a teleological one than a, a causal one. Um, but that really you can have both types of explanation for anything. Now, Bayer admits right, that teleological explanations are real explanations. And so one, one thing he wants to fend off in this piece and in this part of the piece he wants to fend off the objection that science is committed to rejecting why, why questions outright or why explanations outright. So teleological explanations tell us why something happened, but these are only warranted, we, we only need a teleological explanation in a case where something happens for a reason, that is it actually happens for some kind of purpose. Um, so science can, admit of teleological explanations when they're appropriate, but Bayer says we don't need both kinds of explanation for all kinds of phenomena. Uh, instead, one or the other kind of explanation can be provided for any phenomena, depending on what kind of phenomena it is, right? If it's the kind that seems to happen for a reason or for some purpose, um, if it's produced by agents like us who work in terms of reasons and purposes, then that kind of explanation is warranted. But not all phenomena are like that. So if I burn your house down, Bayer says, you're perfectly justified in asking and expecting an explanation from me about why I did it. If a wildfire burns your house down, right, or just an accident, right, there's, uh, you know, maybe it's a, an electrical malfunction or whatever it is, right? Um, if your house is burned down and it wasn't anybody's purpose to do so, it, it occurred, in that scenario, what 
would be inappropriate is to still demand for teleological explana uh, explanation, right? To demand why why did it happen that this wildfire burned my house down? If you want something more than the how it occurred, then you're ultimately making an unjustified demand. So Bayer puts it this way: he says this Socratic view, however, is wrong. That Socratic view is demanding that both kinds of explanation can be offered for any and all phenomena. Bayer says it is not the case that there are two kinds of explanation for everything. One partial, preliminary, and not really clarifying, the other full, final, and illuminating. The truth is that these two kinds of explanation are equally explanatory, equally illuminating, and equally full and final, but that they are appropriate for different kinds of explicanda. So again, what he's saying here is that on that Socratic view, we've got these two kinds of explanation, both kinds can be offered for anything, and the causal explanations are, as Bayer puts it, partial, preliminary, and not really clarifying. They tell us something about what's going on, but not sort of ultimately what it is or why it occurred or why it's important. Um, and that the teleological explanations are really full, final, and illuminating. So Bayer admits there are two kinds of explanation, both of these kinds of explanation, but you don't need all, or, um, not all phenomena need both kinds of explanation. Rather, either can fully explain a, a given phenomenon, right? Depending on the kind of phenomenon it is. Uh, and it, it, we start to get a little bit technical. Um, arguably, you could say at least for some phenomenon, the ones that are done for purposes or done for reasons, we could give both kinds of explanation because we could give the explanation in terms of purposes and reasons. We could also give the explanation in terms of how something happened, even though it was done for a reason. Right. So if I burn your house down, I could give you the reason for it. Um, and then we could also talk about how I went about and did it. Um, but arguably, we can, we can distinguish those into two different things to be explained in the first place. Right? We could say, look, even though we're, we're talking about sort of one event, we talk about the why it occurred as one thing, and we can talk about how it occurred as another. Also, uh, sort of general caveat, I have no interest in burning anybody's house down. Right. Whether it's you watching the video or anybody else, I'm just using that for the, the sake of an example. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. So this, this view that we've been um, already considering here, thinking about it a little bit more, right? That scientific explanations are really always partial. Uh, that is, that scientific or causal explanations never provide a full explanation. Now, why, why is that? Let's dig a little bit deeper here. Why is it that giving the causes for something's occurrence don't fully explain why it occurred? Well, precisely because we can always um, produce a regress and push those explanations back a step, asking for additional causes. So say we explain how one thing occurred by pointing to its cause, right? But then we can ask about the cause of the cause, and then we can ask about the cause of the cause of the cause and the cause of the cause of the cause of the cause, right? We can always go one step back, right? We say, okay, this thing happened. We say, oh, well, you know, we sort of scratch our heads, but well, how did that thing happen? And we can provide a cause, right? Well, this thing caused that thing. Oh, okay. But then what caused that thing, right? Can't we go back again? And can't we go back again? And the thing is we can't, we can always go back again. We can always ask that further question. Well, why, why did that happen? Or rather, how did that happen? Uh, I, I, one small side note, I do think Bayer is, in some sense, maybe a little bit hasty in how he distinguishes between how and why questions, because I think at least sometimes when we ask why, you know, in, in this kind of case, we're asking about um, just sort of natural phenomena that don't clearly have a purpose. I do think using language the way we normal do, normally do, we can ask why it happened. And sometimes we, we are looking for a purpose or a reason as an answer. But I think other times we are still just looking for another how in a sense. We're just looking for a, a cause to, to answer that. Now, so Bayer admits, he says, look, one way of thinking causal explanations don't provide full explanations. And that, and if we conceive of scientific explanations as being primarily causal explanations, we might say they never provide full explanations precisely because they admit of this regress. We can always say, well, yeah, but well, what about this? And what about this? What about the, you know, what about the next one, right? What about the previous one? But Bayer notes that we can do the same thing with teleological explanations. Right? This potential of an, of an infinite regress, 
right? Pushing the explanation step, or uh, pushing the explanation back another step is always possible, right? We can ask for a reason for something, and then we can ask for a reason for the reason, and a reason for the reason for the reason, right? So let's just say, I wanna switch this up now. Let's say you burn my house down. I'm tired of being the bad guy, right? So you burn my house down. I say, why'd you do it? And you say, because I hate you. I go, why do you hate me? You say, because you're just so boring, right? Oh, this class is terrible. I just, I had to listen to you way too much, and eventually I just, I snapped, and I just had to, you know, I had to do something. I say, but, so then why'd you take the class? Or, you know, why'd you find me so boring? I can keep asking, right? And you can presumably keep giving me answers at least for a while, but I can always ask more about, yeah, but why that? And why that? And why that? And eventually the answers are gonna give up. So both causal and teleological explanations admit of the possibility of this potentially infinite regress that we can always keep trying to push it back another step. So if we look at scientific explanations as causal explanations, right? If we think um, wrongly Bayer believes, if we think that scientific explanations are fundamentally causal, they just point us to causes, but not to whys, not to purposes or reasons, it could be objected that scientific explanations can never provide full explanations. Bayer's point here is that neither can teleological explanations if the whole problem is this potential infinite regress, right? the ability to keep going back, back, back. So this potential for the infinite regress is ultimately created by our acceptance of the principle of sufficient reason, which Bayer articulates this way. He says this principle is really that there must be an explanation for the existence of anything and everything, the existence of which is not logically necessary, but merely contingent. Now, there, there are a couple of other ways of formulating the principle of sufficient reason. Um, I, I think a very easy one, uh, very easy accessible way to formulate it is just that there's a reason why everything happens the way it does, right? And often people will say something like everything happens for a reason. I think usually when people say that, really what they're trying to get is that everything happens for a good reason. So even if things don't appear to be for the best, ultimately they are even if you can't understand it yet. That's not what the principle of sufficient reason says in and of itself. The principle of sufficient reason is just saying everything happens for a reason. Right? It's not that everything happens for the best or that the world is, is ordered in a, a sensible or, or morally good fashion. It's just saying that things are in principle explainable. It, it's the world isn't a random chaotic mess of stuff where things literally happen for no reason at all. Rather, if something happens, if something is the way it is, there is some sufficient reason why it's that way and not some other way. So look, uh, if we look at all the books on my shelves and, and the color of the walls and all the stuff around me, right? Why is that lamp over there? Why is this uh, painting up on the wall? And, and why is there this other thing? Why are all those books there? We can give a sufficient reason for all of those. Why are the books stacked in the order they're stacked and not in a different order? Well, sufficient reason, perhaps not a great one, but that's the order in which they were initially stacked. Right? That's why they are the way they are now. So, we can formulate this principle a few different ways. The way Bayer does it here, drawing on logical necessity versus contingency, um, this matters for what he wants to do, so let's pause just to make a little bit more sense of this. When something is said to be contingent, um, that really means it could exist or, or could not exist. Um, for something to be, and, and perhaps I should even formulate that a little bit differently, it's not merely about existence, but if something is contingent, some fact or state of affairs, it could be otherwise. It's a good way to put it. If something's contingent, it could be otherwise. So if we're thinking about something's existence being contingent, which is really what Bayer's talking about in the way he formulates it, uh, when we say that its existence is contingent, we're saying it could have been the case that it didn't now exist. So if I'm contingent, my existence is contingent, really what I'm saying is that it's possible that I would now not exist. So the fact that I now do exist itself, according to the principle of sufficient reason, requires some kind of explanation or reason for why things are the way they are. I exist and I'm here wearing a green shirt, talking to you, et cetera, et cetera, rather than some other state of affairs. Me not existing, me wearing a different shirt, me not talking to you, whatever. Now, this talk of logically necessary, this, this is sort of a, a tricky one. Um, if something, something's existence is logically necessary, 
then it just, it has to exist, right? It's impossible for something that's logically necessary to not exist or, or not be true, depending on exactly how we want to talk about it. So this is the distinction Bayer's trying to draw here, and, and with the principle of sufficient reason, the way he has it formulated, if something exists and its existence is logically necessary, that means that it's impossible for that thing to not exist, which means we don't have to point to any other sort of explanation or reason why it does exist. It's logically necessary. It's not the kind of thing that requires a reason or explanation for why it exists rather than not. But when things are contingent and exist contingently, the principle of sufficient reason, which we generally buy into, right? Most of us walk around thinking things in general happen for some kind of reason, some, some kind of cause, right? Uh, things don't happen for literally no reason whatsoever. The world isn't fundamentally random. Well, for anything that exists that is contingent, that is, for anything that could be different, we have to be able to point to some kind of explanation or reason for why it's the way it is. Okay, so with that in our back pocket, moving on to Bayer's next point and, and his engagement with sort of broadly speaking religious and in particular sort of Christian, but I think we can sort of bracket that. So religious explanations versus scientific secular explanations. Uh, we're thinking about the principle of sufficient reason, right? There is this potential regress that you get in scientific explanations that whenever you explain something, you can always move back, right? Back another level. You explain the thing in question, say, yeah, but why is that explanation work the way it does? Or, you know, we point to the cause of one thing and we say, yeah, what's the cause of the cause and the cause of the cause, of the, right? Um, so there's this potential regress. So it seems like our explanations are maybe never full or final or complete. But, and, and the reason for that is because we buy into the principle of sufficient reason. But it's thought that even though Bayer's already said teleological explanations can have that same regress, you know, well, why, 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 why? Uh, traditionally, it's been thought that God is a logically necessary being and so escapes that, that regress, escapes the problem, right? And so one very easy way of, of putting this, um, if we're trying to explain the universe around us in scientific terms, where we say, okay, uh, why do humans exist? And we say, oh, well, you know, you point to, you know, like, why do I exist, right? Uh, what's, what's science going to do? Come back with a lot of hows, right? Why do I exist? Well, because you, you go on living, you're this biological process, and you've sustained yourself all this time. Yeah, yeah, but, but you know, why am I here? Why, why did I start, right? It's very simple. Your parents procreated, right? Oh, great. Okay, well, thanks. I knew that. But, but I mean, like, why, you know, why are they here, right? Well, their parents procreated. Okay, yeah, but why is the whole human species here? Well, it evolved from some other species, right? Yeah, but why were they here? And then we go back and back and back, and ultimately, right, let's just take the current cosmological picture that I've talked about previously in the, in the questionnaire. So why, why is the universe here, right? Oh, there's a big bang and sort of everything expanded and a whole bunch of stuff happened eventually get the earth and the solar system right yeah but why'd that happen right like it seems like eventually we break down right why did the big bang occur in the first place right that's where where many scientific explanations just sort of go silent which isn't to say all because some scientists are trying to offer theories about that uh, whether or not any of them are, are really good or acceptable or satisfactory separate question but there are uh, scientific theories about how the Big Bang started and, and so on. But it seems like eventually scientific theories are not going to be full or complete or final because we can always call whatever we're given into question. It seems like religious explanations are better because God, if God's a necessary being, escapes this requirement. And if we say, well, look, God created the universe and, and all things, God created the Big Bang and, and sort of everything else that happened, you say, oh, why did Right, but why does God exist in the first place? That's precisely what this move, saying God is a logically necessary being, is supposed to exclude. Right? If God's a necessary, logically necessary being, asking why God exists or demanding the explanation or reason why God exists rather than not exist, itself is inappropriate. But Bayer thinks 
this idea, this, this view that God is a logically necessary being, is just outdated. As he says, he says, it is no longer seriously in dispute that the notion of logically necessary being is self-contradictory. Whatever can be conceived of as existing can equally be conceived of as not existing. Uh, so I, I don't want to get into exactly what, what he's saying about it being self-contradictory. That could be an interesting little thing to engage with in Bayer, say in a forum or something like that. Again, you don't need to, just throwing out ideas here and there. Um, but really what Bayer's getting at is that it, it seems like this is no longer a satisfactory view. So one argument that's been offered, um, particularly through the medieval period up in, into the 18th, 19th centuries, um, is that ultimately God is a, a logically necessary being. God is the sort of thing that just has to exist. Uh, this is really the ontological argument for the existence of God. That argument is still around, and so I think perhaps Bayer is overstating his point a little bit, um, but certainly the popularity of the view that God is just a logically necessary being, uh, that is it's just sort of inconceivable that God could not exist, that view, I, I think it's accurate, so it has largely fallen out of favor. Right? It's not that uh, nobody believed God, it's that, uh, it's not that nobody believes God exists anymore. Right? That's not the question. It's not a question about whether or not there are still many theists. There are. It's a question about whether or not we think you can coherently imagine God not existing. Right? Can you just conceive of God not existing? Right? If you say, well, yeah, right? like I can imagine that. I don't think it's true, but I can imagine it. That's really where you're crossing the line that supposedly you can't cross according to the ontological argument, and seemingly from the way Bayer's talking about it, uh, to conceive of God as a logically necessary being is really to say that God is the sort of thing that you actually just can't even imagine not existing. So even if uh, we concede God is logically necessary, so Bayer does this a few times where he says, look, I don't think this is true, but for the sake of argument, let me just concede it, uh, just so we can see what what follows from that concession. So even if we concede that God is a logically necessary being, right, it's the sort of being that no further uh, hows or whys could be asked of, the notion of the creation of the universe from nothing, so the creation ex nihilo by God, really adds nothing further to our understanding. So if we're puzzled at why the universe exists uh, based on scientific explanations, and we try to sort of answer those those questions or we try to give a further explanation by saying okay and the whole reason the universe exists in the first place is because god made it and we say okay but made it out of what was there stuff lying around already we say no no, no made it out of nothing and we say okay but how did god make it out of nothing really there's not much more to say because when we ask how somebody made something generally speaking we're asking how they converted material from one state to another right so if if somebody makes i don't know a wooden chair we're going to really be asked, well, how did they make that? We're going to give an explanation in terms of, okay, well, trees grow and they're made of wood and you can chop them down and then you take the wood and you do stuff to it and you can you'd make a chair, right? Um, but of course, if it's the question, okay, well, how do you make another tree? We could talk about that. Uh, but if it's the question, how do you make a tree or a chair or a piece of wood or whatever it is out of nothing? You just make it appear. There just isn't more to be said, really, right? Um, I'm, I'm sorry for the sudden pause. I just realized uh, well into this, this lecture. I wasn't sure if it was recording. <laughs> I was fairly certain it was, uh, but I just got horribly worried I'd been wasting my time here talking to myself, which wouldn't be. Um, that unusual for me, uh, I tend to talk to myself a fair bit, but given that my purpose right now is to try to talk to you, it would have been a real waste of my energy um, if I hadn't have actually been recording, that is. Okay, uh, so Bayer's point here is that if we try to appeal to God creating the universe and everything in it from nothing as a way of increasing our understanding of why things are here now, right? Uh, so this. And really, what are we dealing with? 
this part of this question or, or this, this issue about the meaning of life, you know, where do we come from? Why, why is everything here to start with, right? Um, this, this is what we're looking at. We can try to give a scientific cosmological explanation. Here's what we see stars doing, right? We're gonna give a story about the Big Bang and so on. That's gonna be the most popular one right now. We say, yeah, well, well why does that happen the way it does? On one view, science just can't give us a full or final explanation. It can't give us the why, right? So maybe God can, we appeal to God. Well, God made it all, made it out of nothing. But Bayer says, this still leaves at least some kind of mystery for us. Right? Minimally, there's, there's a how question. How does God make everything from nothing? And there's just no answer. Right? All, all we can say is that, well, God makes everything from nothing. And if you pose it as an interactive, but how does God make everything from nothing? There, there's just really not much more to say. Right? Um, no further explanation could really be required. So just adding that extra one layer, saying God made everything from nothing, doesn't really seem to increase our, our understanding. Bayer things. Um, and of course, there are these other sorts of questions that we could still pose to God, sort of a la Nozick. Uh, you know, why did God create the universe? Why did God create all these things? Um, why did God create at the particular time God did create? All right. uh, we could ask more of these questions. Right? Uh, so even if we could give a, a teleological explanation for the origins of the universe, right? Why God made everything. But Bayer thinks that's really not going to be any better than a causal explanation. Appealing to God to help uh, deepen our causal explanation is not going to make it any better. Instead of saying, well, it all started with the Big Bang, saying it all started with God making everything from nothing, that's not really going to add anything to it. Uh, trying to explain it in terms of, of God's purposes for creating everything, Bayer thinks isn't really going to add anything uh, either, right? If we admit that God existence log logically necessary, say, okay, so that one doesn't need explaining. You know, why did God exist in the first place? Let's just wave that one. Bayer thinks we're really not getting anything more in our explanations. He puts it this way, says, what then does all this amount to? Merely to the claim that scientific explanations are no worse than any other. All that has been shown is that all explanations suffer from the same defect all involve a vicious, infinite regress. In other words, no type of human explanation can help us to unravel the ultimate, unanswerable mystery. So really so far, here's Bear's point, right? Scientific explanations are no worse than any other type of explanation. That is, scientific explanations aren't missing something crucial that religious explanations can offer because all of them admit of the same vicious regress, that same possibility, that we can always keep asking why or how and pushing it back a further step. All right, so whether we want our explanation to terminate with, with God on a religious explanation or terminate just with, you know, talking about matter and motion or, or the reasons of creatures like us in a scientific explanation, uh, we can get the same level of satisfactory or perhaps unsatisfactory explanation out of either kind. But, Bayer says, just going back to the start and thinking again to where he's going to end up, scientific explanations have become better than religious explanations for uh, the, the subject matter they treat of because they're more precise, they're better able to uh, produce testable hypotheses, um, they're better able to guide our, uh, um, um, they allow us to manipulate nature in a, a more accurate and, and more powerful way. Right. And just think about contemporary technologies we have. Okay, so scientific explanations really aren't any worse than religious explanations. And it seems like what we get here is kind of uh, something of a, of a mystery, right? How did creation actually occur? How did the universe start, right? Whether we appeal to God or not, it seems like our understanding really starts to break down at that point, right? How, how did it start? Where did it come from? The answer is, you know, from nothing. It's not clear how we can understand that. Now, Christianity and, and sort of religion more generally certainly can take this unanswerable mystery. This, you know, how does creation out of nothing happen? Right? It's it's a mystery. It's a miracle. It's something we can't fully understand. Um, religion can take that as evidence in support of its view. Right? Why? 
because it admits such mysteries exist and then hold their matter for faith, whereas they seem like they're problematic for science because science is supposed to be able to explain everything, but obviously now cannot. Uh, and it can be taken that if science is supposed to be uh, something that's produced through the exercise of our own power of reason, then if science is unable to explain this, then there's something that our reason can't explain. So we might then draw on faith and say, ah, so faith is required to actually have a full explanation of where things came from and why they exist in the first place. But Bayer thinks this view is, is mistaken as well. Uh, ultimately, Bayer thinks this is really demanding too much of scientific explanations precisely because it is uh, you know, looking at the potential for the vicious infinite regress that can get produced by always, you know, why, 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 and pushing back. Um, but he says, explanations don't need to be this kind of thing, right? We don't have to have explanations that explain absolutely everything and sort of close off the possibility of any further questioning. Instead, what we need to do is to realize what explanations really are, right? which are really attempts to make someone understand something. And then we need to understand the ways in which explanations do that. So Bayer puts it this way. He says, explaining something to someone is making him understand it. This involves bringing together in his mind two things, a model which is accepted as already simple and clear, and that which is to be explained, the explicandum, which is not so. Understanding the explicandum is seeing that it belongs to the range of things which could legitimately have been expected by anyone familiar with the model and with certain facts. So, and, and so that's the end of Bayer for the moment. So ultimately, we're gonna see on, on the next slide here, Bayer thinks there are these two kinds of, of explanations, so not just the causal teleological ones, but rather uh, an, another distinction he wants to draw between two kinds of explanations. Explanations are ultimately attempts to make people understand something. When people do understand something, there's no further need for an explanation. And so ultimately, science can give us full explanations if they clear up and, and you know, make us understand all the things there are to understand. Right? Uh, just because there are certain things like, say, creation from nothing that was really nothing further to understand or, or explain, itself doesn't point to some kind of uh, necessary shortcoming in scientific explanations that religious explanations are required to sort of top up or finish by appealing to purposes, uh, uh, by providing the teleological explanation for why things are. Right? So again, one, is, uh, one way of looking at the origin of things is to say, okay, what science can give us is the causal explanation, right? It tells us how it happened, that's the Big Bang. Right? That's what the scientists are doing. But there's the separate question, but why did the Big Bang happen at all? Science can't answer that, but religious explanations can answer that. And that's where we invoke God and God's reasons for creating the universe. And then we would have a full explanation of all of it. Right? Bayer precisely wants to resist that. He wants to say, look, once, once you've got the full how story here, there's just nothing more to it. Right? You're, you're not missing anything. Okay, so this distinction he makes, these two kinds of explanations that he wants to invoke now. These are model and unvexing explanations. So a model explanation, as the name suggests, provides a kind of model by which to understand some explicandum, right? Something to be explained. In addition to model explanations, there are unvexing explanations. Now, Unvexing explanations arise from some seeming incongruity, some discrepancy or, or disagreement between some explanatory model that we've assumed, right, that, that we're using to understand how things work, and some fact. So Bayer takes the example of a game of chess for this. Uh, if you don't have any idea how chess works, um, I, I guess you could think about this. You could think about this in terms of other games as well. Um, to have a model explanation of chess or some other game is to understand sort of in general how it works, right? So if we think about chess, um, to have a model explanation of chess is to understand it's played by really two, two people or, or two teams in some sense, right? There's, there's two sides to it. 
Each side controls one set of pieces. Those pieces are uniform. Everybody has the same number of pawns and everybody has one, you know, king and queen and two bishops and two rooks and two knights. Um, so, you know, we, it's to understand what all the pieces are, understand what all of the legitimate moves are. What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? What's the goal of the game to win? How do you win? What's the win condition, right? Understanding what constitutes a good move and a bad move within that, that framework. And so again, you can think of something else, you know, we think about say soccer um, or take any other sport or game. Same thing, just like chess, you can give a model explanation for soccer, okay, the game is played between two teams. Uh, they play against each other. Each team is trying to win. Each team is composed of a similar number of players. Here's the number of players, right, and their various positions and so on. I don't know enough about sports to actually talk about this in, in a sensible fashion. Um, right, here are the, the rules, right, in terms of time and scoring, um, what you're allowed to do and not, right? In soccer, you can't just pick up the ball and run down the field, um, right? Uh, so all these questions about what what sorts of moves are allowed, what sorts of moves aren't allowed, what's the goal, and so on, right? So the full model explanation for games like this can involve things like purposes, right? You know, what what are what's each team or player trying to accomplish? What are they trying to do? How do they go about doing that? What kind of moves can they make? What constitutes a good move versus a bad move, given the limits on what you're allowed to do and what your goals are? Right? When we run across a move that we don't understand, right, whether it be in soccer or baseball or right, I, whatever, hockey, um, chess, right, you could think video games as well, right, like really any, any kind of game, anything that has some kind of rule set and purpose, um, right, and of course we talk about why do people play these things in the first place, uh, you know, we give various reasons for that as well. Um, one reason, fun, another reason, striving for excellence of a certain kind, another reason, money, or right? another reason, uh, you know, people want to watch it for entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we get the model explanation, which really tells us what the thing is in general, and sort of how it works, and even why it's engaged in, and, and so on. Unvexing explanations are called for when we understand the model explanation, but then don't understand some particular uh, fact, right, some, some thing. So say you understand how chess works, but then you see somebody make a really bad move, right? Well, it, it causes some kind of confusion. It calls for an explanation precisely because you understand what moves would be good moves. Uh, and then if somebody made a really bad move, it makes you wonder why they did it. Say you think about a sport. You understand how, that, how the sport works, and then you see somebody make just a really, really bad move. That calls for an unvexing explanation, right? Why did they do that? Right? Why did they score on their own net? Why did they, you know, uh, draw that penalty when they didn't have to? Of course, one kind of explanation is just an accident. They didn't mean to. They just sort of screwed up when it happened. Okay, that makes sense of it, right? It was unintentional. But what if that's not it? What if they say, no, no, it was intentional, right? You would be, again, vexed, right? But why would they intentionally do something that, that counts against their own purposes? Okay, um, Bayer makes three points about these two types of explanations. So I, I think I've explained here what they are, just sort of in general, right? Model explanation gives you sort of an overview of how the thing works. It gives you a model um, of how to understand that, what its usual functioning is like. The unvexing explanation is invoked and, and provided when we have an understanding of how the thing typically works, but then run into something that doesn't fit the model. So three points about these two types of explanations. First, unvexing proposes model understanding, but not vice versa. We can only be vexed in, in the sense that Bayer's talking about. When we already have a model to understand something, but run into some fact or, or phenomenon that doesn't fit our model, right? It defies our expectations. So again, think about, say, we have a model for um, how objects move in space. Of some you know physical model, um, and then we run into something that doesn't fit the model. Right? We we only demand an unvexing model when we or an unvexing explanation when we already have some kind of model, and then find something that doesn't fit it. 
right? If you don't even have a model to start with, you can't ask for an unvexing explanation. Second, there are certain things which cannot call for unvexing explanations, right? such as a good move in chess. We have a model that describes and explains how uh, some phenomenon works, and then things work the way the model says it does, there's really nothing there to be vexed about, right? There's, there's nothing curious about it. Uh, you understand how soccer works, and you see a perfectly legitimate move in soccer, one that makes perfect sense, right? It's a, it's a great move, results in a goal. If you're confused, the problem's with you, right? And in fact, it's hard to see how you could be confused if you, if you have an adequate model of how soccer works and then get confused by something that fits perfectly well with the model. Third, model understanding implies being able, without further thought, to have model understanding of a good many other things, while indexing understanding does not. So model understanding is really a, this sort of broader view about how various things fit together. Unvexing explanations or unvexing understanding is, is particular and specific, right, more than anything. Um, oh, and, and one comment on the second point that Bayer made, which I, I think is a nice one. I, I want to share it, even though it's just a little out of order here. He says, you know, based on the second one, intellectual problems do not arise out of ignorance, but out of insufficient knowledge. An ignoramus is puzzled by very little. Once a student can see problems, she is already well into the subject. Um, and I think that's, that's a nice note, um, right? When, if, if we just don't know anything, but we don't really care, we're not usually puzzled. But when, when we can start asking good questions, that really is a way of demonstrating what we know, right? Uh, we can show what we know by asking questions that demonstrate a, a understanding and mastery of what's already known and point to potential problems, uh, potential sort of gaps in our knowledge that we haven't filled in yet. So, and uh, you know, why, why am I sharing this? Because it, if you can ask good questions, you're well on your way to understanding something. All right, so we've got these three points about these two kinds of explanations. Now, applying these two kinds of explanations to a natural phenomena. So, Bayer thinks explaining natural phenomena, you know, the way the world works around us, is much like explaining a game of chess. Right? They're both suitably explained by a model which accounts for all the facts. Right? There's a difference, though. Chess is a game we made up. Right? And as Bayer says, the first person who invented the, the rules of chess, or right, and we could apply this to anything else, soccer, baseball, whatever, they couldn't have really been wrong about the rules precisely because they were just making something up. Uh, if you look at, at children who just, or, or anybody, when people are making up their own games, in a sense they can't get it wrong. They might make sort of better or worse decisions that make the game as a result more or less fun. But there's nothing to get wrong if you're making it up in the first place. But that's not the case for natural phenomena, right? Natural phenomena run according to some set of, of rules, so far as we can tell. They work in some particular determinate way, right? Objects don't just sort of move in, in random patterns that we can never predict. We've gotten really, really good at predicting the patterns in which things will move based on, on physics. Um, we've gotten really good at explaining, you know, chemical reactions in terms of different chemical, you know, different chemical substances, and how they get mixed together and what's gonna happen. We've gotten really good at all sorts, uh, at explaining all sorts of natural phenomena. Right? In those cases, those phenomena are, are being governed by rules that we didn't make up, but rather are discovering, uh, which is a little bit different from things like games of chess. Now, sometimes there are instances where the only way to unvex ourselves to increase our understanding um, is really to change our model. So sometimes if you know when we're working with a model trying to explain something, um, we we can start getting vexed and not really understand why things are working the way they are. Sometimes the only way to get unvexed is just by changing a model. So for instance, uh, Bayer talks about models of having a, a round or flat Earth, right? Uh, 
you, if you have a model of the flat earth, you can get pretty vexed by a number of things. You know, why don't people fall off it? Why, as we you know, go up a mountain or go to a, a taller height, why can we see farther? Why does a, a ship, when it's disappearing over the horizon on the water, uh, sort of go down and eventually you see just the top part disappear? Right? Why, why do those things occur if you're working with a model of the flat earth or if you're working with a geocentric model of the solar system? Um, once you start observing that things don't just neatly go across the sky and, and sort of follow this consistent pattern as it circles the Earth, once you start seeing that, in fact, those patterns exhibit all sorts of other behaviors, you have to try to unvex that in a way. In fact, the geocentric model did that, right? So it was, it was recognized back in antiquity that particularly the planets don't follow a, a simple circular orbit around Earth, because if they did, um, it wouldn't be what we saw. And so as a way of trying to retain the geocentric model and fit the observations, they tried to unvex that by introducing what they called epicycles. I'll, I'll leave it for you to look it up. Basically a little like orbits on top of orbits. And that seemed to fit what we're looking at, but particularly with Galileo and the telescope, there were more and more complicating little sort of vexing factors that had to be introduced and explained away in the geocentric model. Eventually switching to the heliocentric model the way Copernicus wanted and the way Galileo thought was a good idea as well, it just made everything much more simple. It made everything more cognitively satisfying. All of a sudden everything just fit into place. A uh, similar sort of change occurred moving from, you know, really Aristotelian physics to Newtonian physics and from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics. Um, you can try to unvex it, you can try to, in a sense, sort of tweak the model and say, oh, you're confused on this little part, and here's, here's how to understand this part and how it fits in. But at some point, if the model just doesn't fit very well, really the way to um, clear up confusion is just to change our model, right? So coming back to this question of, so now we're into the, the fourth part here. So this is the distinction now between model and unvexing explanations. So coming back to this issue about whether or not scientific explanations necessarily create a vicious regress and thus are necessarily incomplete, Bayer employs this distinction. He says, look, unvexing explanations do not create an infinite regress. As he says, vexing explanations truly and completely explain what they set out to explain, namely how something is possible which, on our explanatory model, seem to be impossible. So an unvexing explanation is really there to fix a problem right, between the model you're using and some observed fact or phenomenon. So what about model explanations? Can they create kind of regress? Well, yes, they can. So indexing explanations just don't, right? They just sort of solve a local problem once it's solved, that's it. But a model explanation can create a kind of regress because a model explanation can be subsumed under some more general model, right? So one model might take something as just a brute fact, right? Something that just exists, it just, it's there, and there's no further explanation for it. That's what philosophers mean when we talk about brute fact. Um, for instance, I was just talking about Newton's theory of gravity. So Newton's theory superseded that sort of medieval Aristotelian theory of physics, which tried to invoke why things move at sort of different speeds and different rates and, and fall in different sorts of ways by appealing to uh, particular properties of objects. So different sorts of objects had different sorts of, of gravitas or heaviness and, and um, different sorts of momentums and so on. Newton really does away with all this and, and really sort of picking up on, you know, Galileo is working on this as well in the scientific revolution. Ultimately, what does Newton give us this really concise set of mathematical formulas saying, okay, here are really the laws governing motion of physical bodies. Uh, within that, of course, is gravity, this notion of, of universal gravity. But Newton didn't explain what it was. Right? He sort of famously just sort of shrugs and says, like, I don't know, right? I'm giving you this mathematical model that you can use to predict quite accurately how things are gonna move, right? Uh, and gravity is this core component that holds things together. It's this force that acts at a distance, right? But what is it? Where does it come from? Right? What are its origins? How, how exactly does it work? What sort of thing is it? Is it an energy or, right? Newton just, I, I don't know, right? It's just, it's just there, 
right? He, he doesn't explain it anymore. Now, we can take that Newtonian model that just doesn't explain that one part and subsume it under a more general model, such as general relativity. So one of you know, Einstein's big theories, really in a sense the biggest one, which itself gives a kind of explanation for what gravity is and why it exists. It's a curvature of space-time for Einstein. Right? Um, that tells us more than Newton's did. Now, do we have a more general model to subsume Einstein's you know, theory of general relativity? Not right now. And in fact, if you look at physics, part of the, the outstanding work being done in physics is that they've got sort of these four main forces, um, gravity, uh, electromagnetism, and then the strong and weak nuclear forces. And they can't quite figure out how to fit them all together. Uh, of course, there are these questions about, well, how do you fit together general relativity and, and quantum physics? Eh, they don't know, right? They've got pretty good theories um, in, in various areas, but it's not clear yet how to actually subsume those theories, how to bring them together in one larger theory where the various partial theories now would, would really be parts of some bigger theory. So this is the issue, right? Unvexing explanations don't create a regress, they just solve some local problem. But a model explanation, right, explains some set of phenomena, some range of things, but we don't have some theory that explains everything. There is a potential regress here because you can take a model explanation and fit it into a larger model explanation. Now, there's the possibility here that these get larger and larger and larger. You get, you know, theories coming together, creating larger theories. Uh, and so this is something that Bayer himself says, you know, look, uh, odds are we're never, we're never going to sort of reach the end of inquiry or, or sort of, uh, we're never going to reach a point where we can't do this anymore. But it's not an infinite regress, right? There is, um, Bayer really sort of makes two points here and you know, well, why don't we have an infinite regress on our hands with models? First, just not everything requires a further explanation, right? Because not all things produce perplexity. So uh, just thinking about Newton's theory itself about gravity, um, depending on, on whether or not we're satisfied with it, it itself just doesn't call for any further explanation, right? If we're not confused about it, there's, there's really no need for another explanation. But even if we keep doing that and we keep demanding more out of our models, there is going to be, as Bayer puts it, an objective limit to which such explanations tend and beyond which they are pointless. And this would be a kind of all-encompassing model explanation of everything. So this would be, you know, as it often gets called, particularly in, in physics, uh, a theory of everything. Uh, in particular, if we could bring to, uh, together all of humanity's theories about everything, and I think really big scale. Imagine we, we stick around, we colonize the stars, and we exist for a billion years. Uh, we investigate everything as much as we can. There's no new test or question to, to there's no new question to ask or test to be run or, or anything. Right? We've done it all. We've checked it all, and we have the best theory we have. It all fits together. There's no uh, sort of ugly bits to it, right? Nothing that we had to kind of fudge or just fill in for now. There's no conflicts or incoherence. We have this full model explanation of everything that happens. That, Bayer thinks, would ultimately be this objective limit. Um, so he, he says this, he says, it must be admitted then that in the case of model, exp model explanations, there is a regress, but it is neither vicious nor infinite. It is not vicious because in order to explain a group of explicanda, a model expl explanation need not itself be derived from another more general. It gives perfectly full and consistent explanations by itself. And the regress is not infinite, for there is a natural limit, an all-embracing model, which can explain all phenomena beyond which it would be pointless to derive model explanations from yet others. So when we're thinking about scientific explanations, right? What, what's the best we can hope for from them? Really, the best we can hope for is an all-encompassing model explanation of everything, right? That tells us how everything in the universe operates, right? How it all works. Um, this model can include 
whys where appropriate. It can include teleological explanations. So we ask about purposeful behavior, say, of humans and so on. This all-encompassing explanatory model would also have explanations of that. Right? Now, ultimately, some of it probably is going to be taken as brute fact. Right? Humans pursue uh, pleasurable experiences. Um, you know, when all things considered, they can have those versus, say, painful ones and then not have to sacrifice or give something up. Yeah, but why do humans tend to pursue pleasurable experiences? Might just be a brute fact about us, right? Or maybe there is some further explanation, but eventually we're gonna to get to a point where we're just sort of explaining, like, look, here's how things work, right? And of course, we could always say, yeah, but, but why do they work just that way? Referring to the first point, right? Not everything requires a further explanation. So uh, look, you know, we could be sort of perplexed by gravity a little bit, but then once we understand it's a curvature of space-time and, and how it regularly occurs and so on, um, knowing that it's, it's something regular itself can make it the sort of thing that just doesn't require further explanation because it doesn't produce perplexity, right? I don't require further explanation when everything goes just the way I expect it to. This is, this is really that first point. So um, bringing this back to this, this potential objection that Bayer is trying to deal with, Aren't scientific explanations necessarily provisional, incomplete, right? Aren't they always going to be missing something important? No, right? Um, they, they might in fact be missing something important because we haven't been around long enough to figure everything out yet. Uh, but that doesn't mean that scientific explanations necessarily are going to be incomplete forever or missing something important, that religious explanations need to be invoked to sort of um, complete or, or fill, right? It's not like scientific explanations are always gonna leave out the purposes and, and the meanings of things. And that's something only religion could do for us. Now, of course, it could still be objected here, right? Um, that we can have this full model explanation of how everything works and even sort of why things work the way they do within the universe. But there could still be this question, why is there anything at all? Right? We can still try to push it back and say, yeah, but why did, why did it start? Um, why is there a universe for us to explain in the first place? Now, Bayer thinks that this kind of question is really going to be motivated by a kind of feeling of awe just at the existence of, of everything. But Bayer thinks it's really not a very deep question in the end because there's two possible responses. It's two, and it seems like there's only two. Uh, and they're frankly fairly simple and straightforward. So even though people have been getting you know, quite worked up about, you know, oh, what, what a big question. You know, why, why does anything exist or you know, where did it all come from? There's two answers, right? It's, it's a pretty simple dichotomy. Either the universe is, has existed forever right? or uh, the universe, which Bayer is clear is really the totality of things, originated out of nothing, right? So either it's existed forever or it started at some point and given it's the totality of things, it had to just pop into existence. Because the universe, being everything, can't have come out of something else. If it came out of something else, that other thing would be part of the universe. And so we haven't actually hit the start yet. So th this is really it. These are the only two options. Either the universe has existed forever, or it just started at some point. Now, uh, I know I've already been saying that, uh, and, and Craig mentions this at least a little bit in his piece as well, um, sort of best, most popular current scientific theories are really, you know, the universe started with a Big Bang. Um, like I mentioned, there are cosmologists, there are scientists who are, who are theorizing and, and thinking about what might have come before the Big Bang. There's a real problem there because our theories break down as we approach it. Um, there's, there's no way to really, at least yet, make predictions about what happened before it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean nothing happened before. It doesn't necessarily mean that was the start of the universe. I have noticed a little bit of a tendency in some cosmologists and, and physicists and so on, where they make a little bit of a leap, they move a little bit quickly, um, and they say something like, well, because we can't make any predictions, we can't theorize, and we can't make any observations before the Big Bang, we might as well just ignore anything that happened there. We might as well just say it all just started with the Big Bang. Right. You, you can't make sense of or, or have meaningful talk about time before the Big Bang. Right. Well, perhaps in, in some sense, 
And at least in terms of being a working physicist, maybe it's not worth trying to investigate what happened before that. But philosophically, I, I think there's, um, I think there are at least potential problems with making that kind of hasty move and just trying to cut things off. So option one, the universe has existed forever. Um, it's, it's not wholly implausible, right? It's not impossible, or at least it doesn't seem like it. Um, and so two, the universe, you know, origi originated out of nothing. It sort of popped into existence. Um, and that could be either it just happened, period, or um, God created it out of nothing, right? Again, we're back to that creation ex nihilo. Somehow God just snaps fingers or whatever, creates everything out of nothing. But of course, that in some sense doesn't give us any more information than just the universe just popped into existence out of nothing. If we introduce God, of course, we could say, okay, well, at least we've got some kind of agent to explain why it happened at some kind of particular time. But, of course, God's existence has these same two possibilities, right? Either God existed forever or God popped into existence out of nothing at some point, right? Uh, given that God's own existence seems to admit of these two possibilities, right, just as equally as the universe, there's, I think, a good question here about um, why, why saying that the universe has existed forever would be unsatisfactory if we think saying that God has existed forever is satisfactory. Um, if we say, oh, the universe couldn't have possibly existed forever, there needs to be a good explanation there about what is it about God that's, that makes God relevantly dissimilar to the universe, that we don't think it's problematic to say God has always existed but we do think it's problematic to say that the universe is always existing. So let's sort of put that, put that out there, but uh, I'll leave it there for now. All right, so we're, we're approaching the end here. So if we think the universe originated out of nothing, right, it just appears, it just starts to, to exist, then no further explanation is required, right? If it just popped into existence at one point, why? Why is no further explanation required? Well, we can't ask for an unvexing explanation, right? In this case, when we're asking about the start of the universe, if it just came into being from nothing once, that's all our model will say about it, right? Uh, at the start of time, the universe began to exist, right? Uh, there's just no more to it. There, the, the model has nothing else. So the model in this case only really tells us one thing. At the start of time, the universe began to exist. We have one fact on our hand. At the start of time, the universe began to exist. Obviously, there's no discrepancy or contradiction there. So there's nothing required um, for an unvexing explanation to sort out for us. Now, I've got a little ahead of myself. The model only covers this, this fact, right? Uh, the universe would be pretty unique in this way. We'd have this model that really covers this one thing. Um, but that's it. And of course, we could sort of tweak our model depending on exactly what it is. Um, it'd be pretty surprising if the universe just came out of nothing. Right? That, that would be itself uh, a little bit bizarre, right? It, but it, it can still seem strange. But that doesn't mean that there's an unvexing explanation on hand. That doesn't mean there's any more information that can actually make it any more understandable. It seems more, this is drawing on Bayer, but he doesn't quite say this. It seems more like you'd just be uncomfortable with the fact that the universe just began to exist, rather than that there'd be any sort of actual cognitive uh, um, difficulty there, right? Or any kind of cognitive dissonance or anything. We might not like it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't make any sense or requires further explanation. And lastly, uh, Bayer thinks it's unnecessary to think that the universe had a beginning in the first place, right? Um, he says, you know, of course you might think that, and if you, if you think it had to have a beginning, we can give a scientific model for it, and then there's really nothing further to explain. Um, again, drawing on him and, and pushing a little bit further, if we try to invoke God, we can uh, raise exactly the same questions and difficulties for God's infinite existence as for the universe's infinite existence. Uh, as well as uh, potentially questions about, you know, uh, if we ask why the universe exists, we can ask why God exists and so on. Uh, but this last point that it's really unnecessary to think the universe had a beginning, that is it's an open or live possibility to think that it's existed forever. 
Uh, Bayer gives uh, this, this little aside. Um, in thinking, if you think that the universe had to have come from somewhere, he says this really comes from a logical howler, kind of a logical joke. He says that this is the thought that because everything has an origin, the universe must have an origin too, except that being the universe, it must have originated out of nothing. This is a howler because it conceives of the universe as a big thing, whereas in totality it is the, or whereas in fact, it is the totality of things. That is, not a thing. That everything has an origin does not entail that the totality of things has an origin. On the contrary, it strongly suggests that it has not. For to say that everything has an origin implies that any given thing must have developed out of something else, which in turn, being a thing, must have developed out of something else, and so forth. So what's Bear getting at here? Really what he's getting at is that we don't have really good reason to think that the universe had to have had a start, right? Even if we think that every particular thing in the universe had to have a start, that doesn't add up to thinking the universe as a whole needed to have a start because the universe as a whole isn't a thing. Rather, the universe is really the totality of things. Each thing requires some kind of start, but that actually gives us reason to think that the universe has always existed precisely because it's there as a kind of uh, backdrop for things or it's the totality of things. So when one thing comes to exist, it comes out of something before it, something before that, and something before that. And so the regress might be there, in fact, um, but that's a way of making sense of, of what happened. Now, of course, we can't fully comprehend or imagine an infinitely existing universe. Sure. But what's the alternative? A universe that just starts to exist. And we say, okay, but why? Or, you know, how did that happen? And there's just nothing more to be said, right? That's it. It just starts. And of course, we can say, oh, well, God created, right? So what, how did that work? Well, really, it boils down to God went start, right? Um, and then we can ask these other sort of theological questions about God, but it doesn't seem like we're given more information or more explanation or really um, something that the that scientific model can't cover, Bayer claims. Okay, so I'm going to close here with a, a kind of sum up slide. Bayer himself closes this uh, first part of his piece talking about this. So what was he trying to do here? Trying to defend scientific explanations from the objection that they do not fully explain the world around us, right? This is really what Bayer's been trying to do. Defend scientific uh, explanations from this, this potential objection that they can't fully explain things, that is they can't explain our meaning or why we're here. Um, they can't explain anything about whys or purposes or reasons. So they must not be able to really say anything about meaning, right? If we try to only use scientific explanations, we're necessarily left with a kind of cold and different universe where meaning becomes impossible. Here again, think Cray, think Fack and I. Right? Bayer responded to this objection. He said first, uh, and so the first part of his argument, scientific explanations provide wholly satisfying explanations of uh, at least the natural world, right? Uh, and, and I think we could probably even expand this somewhat, uh, that really depending on the thing in question, they can fully explain everything if they give us an adequate model. Second, those who think that scientific explanations do not provide wholly satisfying explanations of the natural world either first fail to distinguish between model and unvexing explanations, they, they fail to take that difference into account, or second, they misrepresent scientific explanations as essentially causal explanations um, and, and, and claim that scientific explanations can't involve reasons and purposes. And this seems to threaten an infinite regress, right? That they're fundamentally causal explanations, that they leave out purposes, or, right, that scientific explanations ultimately leave us without an explanation of how everything's started. So um, they misrepresent scientific explanations as essentially causal, uh, particularly susceptible to an in, in infinite regress, or unable to explain how things started. Bayer says, to the contrary, scientific explanations can involve purposes and reasons, not just causes, right? They seem to be threatened by an infinite regress, but no more so than any other kind of explanation, right? As long as we subscribe to the principle of sufficient reason, you have that possibility on your hands. But given that 
ideally, scientific explanations will culminate in a model explanation of everything in which all explanations fit neatly together and there's nothing left unexplained other than perhaps why is everything here in the first place that fits this model, right? Uh, Bayer says that, right? Ultimately, that question itself, um, if we have to do that, we're admitting that the model explanation of everything is a good one. And now we just have to sort of regress a whole extra step from that and say, yeah, but why does all of that work the way it does? Which would ultimately be a question about how did everything start in the first place? And in response to that potential shortcoming of scientific explanations, Bayer says, look, um, the scientific explanations here again are going to be no worse than religious explanations because in either case, you have to admit of the same two possible beginnings. Either the universe just started to exist, whether it was you know, created by God or just popped into existence, or second, it's been around forever, right? Um, which you could, and, and this, again, might get us into points of theology that are, are finer than worth going into here. Uh, you can hold the view that the universe has been around forever and that God also exists, and that God has also existed, sort of coexisted with the universe forever. Um, that's not the, the sort of theology of, of Christianity and, uh, to my understanding, Islam and, and Judaism, uh, but it certainly was for likes of, of Plato, particularly Aristotle, that was precisely as we thought the universe was eternal, but there was a God who was really the thing that kept it all going in the first place, right? Uh, so really thinking about God creating all other things somehow after um, already existing was just sort of in, incoherent for, for Aristotle's view. But again, we'll, I'll, I'll leave it there so we don't get it. So boiling it down, trying to make it pretty digestible here, just on this last slide, uh, Bayer says, look, scientific explanations are really no worse off than religious explanations. There's really nothing that religious explanations can provide that's really required for meaning that scientific explanations can't provide. Um, and of course, we might charge that scientific explanations are, are not fully complete or, or satisfying, that they can't explain everything that requires explaining for there to be meaning. But Bayer says, ultimately, that um, that kind of objection results merely from a failure to pay attention to certain uh, crucial distinctions and, and crucial points that can be made about scientific explanations in the first place. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because I realized that was quite a, a lengthy lecture with quite a bit of content to it. Um, if you've got any questions about anything I said in there, please, as always, feel free to contact me. And as always, feel free to engage with, question, or criticize Bayer in the forums or with critical responses. Um, and again, I'll, I'll encourage you to try to stay focused and, and targeted. So if you can think of something in particular Bayer is saying or something he's missing or a particularly good you know, question or objection to pose to him, that would be a great way to engage with um, his thinking of forms this week or a critical response or something like that. Um, or if you've got additional reason why you think he's right, that's also something worth sharing. All right, so I'll finally go ahead and stop this now. And I'll be back tomorrow with my lecture on Russell. Uh, and as I said, Russell in many ways will be sort of picking up on and, and almost assuming some of the things that Bayer has been saying in the background here. All right, I hope you're all doing well. You're off to a good start to the week. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye for now.